Welcome, one and all, to the mystical world of Felbar. Adventures abound throughout this realm, and we appreciate the opportunity to regale you with some stories from these trails. These accounts are all based on actual RPG experiences that occurred within Adventures in Felbar. Some of these tales may be for mature audiences, while others may be for very immature audiences. We now present the sage Mikas Tumo from Tamel, also known as the Bard of Felbar. Welcome to Session Denali-04. Harris the Mage finished dry heaving over the side of the flying porpoise with the steady hand of Sir Omel on his back. Brother Stance arrived to check on the pair and inquired how the mage was doing. The large knight reported that Harris was now completely empty and was currently dry heaving. The monk advised that perhaps a plate full of greasy fish and octopus tentacles may help him out with his issue. This caused the mage to dry heave more. A frumpish look crossed the knight's face and advised him that he had been spending too much time around Phidias. A slight smile crossed the holy man's face and pointed out that Sir Omel was probably right. Harris pulled himself back over the railing and announced that he needed to lay down. After moving a few steps and faltering, the warrior picked up the leith body of the mage and carried him down to his cramped quarters. At the stern section of the vessel, Phidias and the newest member of the group, Yolanda Two Blades, stood watching several whales frolic in the sea. Looking at the opposite side, Yolanda looked at the cliffs that made up the southern coastline. Phidias noticed her staring and asked if she had ever been on a ship before. The fighter confessed that she had been on many voyages, but always enjoyed seeing the southern coastline of her homeland. The gnome then went on to compliment her and pointed out that she had done better on the trip than Harris. He was fine on the way to your land, but that storm really took a toll on the wizard, he said. Yolanda admitted that she too had tossed her stomach as well during the height of the tumult, but had gotten over it quickly. Phidias then began to ask her about why Grish had an issue with her. Yolanda sized up the demi-human and felt that he could be trusted. Well, she began, I actually used to be in the guard service. I was designated to patrol the grounds of the palace during the reign of the great King Bador. After his demise and the ascension of King Pellet and Grish the Outlander, I was stripped of my rank and drummed out of the corps. I took several odd jobs as a sellsword to pay the bills. I've grown up in Denali and never saw the need to leave our land forever. Since the coronation of King Pellet, I have begun to rethink my opinion. Grish and his thugs have begun to target me and have made life rather uncomfortable. Phidias asked her why she felt that way and she pointed out that her open questioning of the dubious heritage of King Pellet was the cause. At the time of Bador's death, he left no known heirs. Sages apparently discovered Pellet, a distant relative, living in the eastern reaches. He was installed without hesitation to benefit a smooth transition of power. I just don't think something is right about that, she said. As the gnome began to ask another question, a bell on the deck started to sound, indicating trouble. The pair looked to the port side where they observed several aquatic ogres boarding the ship. These Mero, as they are called, tossed a pair of sailors over the side of the wooden ship and climbed aboard. With one seaman sounding the bell, the rest moved towards the threat. Phidias and Yolanda began to run towards the threat as another Mero climbed over the starboard side nearby. They surveyed the boarding and observed the enormous Grish moving with the sailors to attack the trio of monsters and opted to attack the solitary creature at the back closer to them. The rogue and the fighter separated and moved off to either side of the large beast attempting to dodge the large fists of the ogre. Yolanda began spinning her dual short swords and yelling at the creature. Once distracted, Phidias was able to move in unnoticed. The ogre smacked one of the blades out of Yolanda's hand, but yelled in pain as the gnome sliced into its leg with his blade. Seizing the opportunity, Yolanda grasped her blade, cutting through the inner thigh of the creature as it kicked Phidias into the railing of the ship, nearly sending him overboard. The mortal wound of the marrow began to cover the deck in blood as it fell to its knees. Yolanda pulled back her sword, preparing for the coup de grace, 
when a pair of silver stars landed in the eye sockets of the creature, causing it to pitch over the side of the ship. Spinning around, the fighter observed Brother Stance with empty hands. It would appear that I won't be getting those blades back, he remarked. The pair slid to the back of the ship over the course of blood and met with the gnome who was attempting to right himself. He was hoisted to his feet and the threesome ran back to the center of the ship just as Grish sent the last marrow over the side. Everyone began to catch their breath and the enormous cleric handed Yolanda back a sword. The damn thing nearly stabbed me in the back, he retorted. Yolanda resheathed their weapon. Thank you, but don't worry, Grish. If I stab you, it'll be to your face. So noted, the gruff cleric huffed. The captain ordered the sailors back to their posts and ordered an additional lookout to the crow's nest. As Sir Omo came back up the stairs, he observed the pool of blood and asked what he had missed. After another hour of travel, several small fishing boats came into view. As the larger flying porpoise began to pass them, they were greeted by the mariners. The PCs gathered on the bow of the ship, except for Harris, who was still feeling under the weather. A city carved into the red cliffs came into view, and the group noticed a lively beachfront with a multitude of buildings. The pale blue accents from Saydown were also present in the city of Red Bluffs. At the highest point of the cliff was a small keep made of gray stone, and to the left, more buildings. The PCs noted that the community was smaller than Saydown, but was still the size of a large town. A group of women present near a long building along the dock area garnered the attention of several sailors as well as Phidias, who began to slick back his hair. Hello, ladies, he uttered, which was quickly followed by a slap to the back of his head from Yolanda. Mind your manners, little one, she reminded him, as Grish also pointed a finger at the rogue. I'll try, but I won't be able to stop the ladies once they see all of this, and he motioned to his squat body. Brother Stance came walking by, helping with the mooring lines, and sarcastically remarked, Those lucky ladies will use you as a footstool, my short friend. The flying porpoise roughly smacked into the dock, and lines were tossed over the side to dock workers. Harris the mage, looking peaked, climbed the stairs and stood with his group. Are you going to be okay? asked Sir Omel. Just get me to ground, please. Just get me to ground, was his only reply. We close out this episode now and give you our thanks for listening. Please subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at The Bards Podcast. For everyone in Adventures at Philbar, thanks for listening.